So the fifth path, we're already up to the fifth one, that a mystery in order to discover God, in order to discover their own divine self, is entitled Practicing Heaven Now. So that begs the question, what's happening in heaven? What does practicing heaven look like for us? How is it that we can know and experience what that might look and feel like in our own lives? According to Richard Rohr, the author of the book that we've been using as our guide to explore these ideas, states this. He says, what's happening in the heavenly kingdom is communion, is unity, and family. In his understanding, what happens in heaven, what is happening in heaven, what's always happened in heaven, is this idea of communion, of unity, and of family. I would add of oneness. That you could kind of bridge all of those together and it would have that feeling and that experience of oneness. What God's love creates in heaven is perfect union. There is no more separation. There is only the one. And God's will is also for that perfect union to be created on earth. Remember, as Jesus taught the disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer, one of those lines was, as it is in heaven, so be it done on earth. Thy will in heaven is thy will in earth. That was the message of Jesus. That was the message that he came to bring to us, that practicing heaven as he was, is all about forgiveness, it's all about reconciliation, it's all about healing, and it's all about communion, that common union that we all share together. Contemplation, in all of its different forms, because there's different ways to practice it, is central to the experience of being able to feel and glean what heaven could look like here on earth. Because when we are in that place of contemplation, when we step away, then we are focused on that deliberate search of God. Because the only way we can really truly connect with God, that we can experience that sense of union, is by in some aspects, detaching ourselves from the, what he calls the passing self. What's the passing self? Well, that is the part of us that is concerned about self-image. That is the part of us that has this desire, this need to feel safe, to be in control, or at least to have the illusion of that. That is the part of us that always wants to feel this sense of happiness as our emotional homeostasis. That is the part of us that attaches on to the false promises of the world about who it is we are and who it is we've come here to be and what will ultimately make us happy. So in many ways, contemplation is like divine therapy. It's different from any therapy we might want to engage in for our human selves because in divine therapy, the ordinary rules of thinking, of explaining, of managing, of fixing of self don't apply. We can't engage with heaven in the same way that we often engage with our human self. And it's necessary that we understand this because, as Einstein was famous for saying, no problem, no challenge can be solved from the same consciousness from which it was created. And so if we're always in our typical human way of being, and that's what ultimately has led to some of the problems we're experiencing in our, our life or in our world, we're not going to find the solution in that same level of thinking. We have to move beyond. We have to 
tap into a different divine resource in order to do that. In the book, What the Mystics Know, Father Rohr's book, he recounts this story, and this was from an initiate who came out of an Indian community. And she was telling him about her growing up, and she said, you know, we were never taught to pray. That wasn't part of our day-to-day um, -day concepts of how we connected with God or the Great Spirit. She said, what would happen is every morning, our mother would wake us up just before dawn, and we'd all have to go out and sit on the front porch on the steps. And she said, while you're sitting here, you have to be absolutely quiet and watch the sunrise. And as the sun was coming up, she would say, now welcome the sun. Quietly, in your mind and heart, welcome it. And once you've welcomed it, she encouraged them to say, now as you watch the sun rising higher, ask the sun to drop its blessings on every part of the earth as it travels on its journey. That was the way that they prayed every day. They would welcome each day and feel a sense of blessing and connection by it. You know, I've shared with you how drawn I am to sunrises and sunsets. In fact, if you look at my camera roll of every place I've ever traveled, the vast majority of the pictures will be of sunrises and sunsets because it is, for me, sort of one of the more magical, mystical times. There's something transcendent about it. There's something non-rational about it. I mean, we know, yeah, it comes up, it goes down, comes up, it goes down. But being in the midst of it, it almost becomes a symbol of hope for a new day. It reminds us every sunrise that we have as God never giving up, that today is a day that's different from any other day, even if it feels similar, that the sun rising is the reminder of the blessings that each of us are open to receive that day. So if you're looking for some place to start practicing heaven, getting up and watching a sunrise is a good place to start. It's a little more tricky, at least where I live, because I have so many houses and trees around me that sometimes it's difficult to be able to get a clear vision of the sun as it's just coming up over the horizon. But I'll tell you, this parking lot out here is a really good spot when we have sunrise services. It, it's a good place to watch the sun coming up. And while incorporating ways to contemplate God's beauty on earth, because that's always a wonderful, natural place to start to connect and to see God, the practice of contemplation must also include, at times, the problems. You know, for many of us, in our prayer time, we just want to push, this is a time to push all of those challenges and issues and problems away and have a moment, what we would perceive to be just some peace. And yet, prayer and meditation are not a time to distract ourselves from the challenges of our life. Rather, they can become a daily merging of them. We can bring them in and love them to the best of our ability until we actually can find a breakthrough and truly be able to embrace them as also part of God's kingdom in heaven. Many quickly and humbly learn in the quiet of their being that how we do anything is how we do everything. That's another good thing to contemplate. How I do anything is how I do everything. And here's what the author meant behind that. He says, if you're critical and angry, especially of self and of the mistakes or what he would term as the sinfulness of our human journey, then those same harsh judgments and criticisms will likely also be extended to the people and the situations outside of yourselves. 
It will also inform your world view. So as we have this time of contemplation, part of our goal is to be able to see ourselves, to see our problems, to see the world's problems through the eyes of God. Most of us have spent many of our moments identifying ourselves, identifying our lives with whatever we're feeling or thinking or whatever beliefs or self-image that we might have created up until this point. And meditation, this time of stepping away, of disconnecting ourselves from that part of us while still embracing whatever's going on in the most loving and, uh, I lost the word that I wanted to say, compassionate way, we can begin to have that also become part of our path to really connect with the God source. It opens the door and it begins to allow us to be able to gently let go of those things that we discover don't really serve us anymore. So I want to invite us all into practicing this right now because thinking about it isn't going to get you there. Wondering about it, well, it might give your brain some good activity and thought process is not going to lead you to that experience. So as we move into this time of meditation in our service, I just invite you to just right where you are, get comfortable. Perhaps take a nice deep breath and let it go. And as you let that breath go, just let go of all that has unfolded up until this moment. And see if you can't bring your mind and your heart fully present into this time and into this space. You might want to close your outer eyes just so that you can bring your full attention within. And the place that we will certainly discover and have communion with God is through that place we identify as our heart, our heart center. So see if you can't bring your attention so that you're gently resting. That part of you that thinks and feels and believes is now encased in this cocoon in the center of your heart. <clears throat> Imagine. Let that God-given gift of imagination bring the image up that you're sitting on the bank of a river where there's boats and ships sailing past. And while the stream floats past your inner eye, Begin to name each one of those vessels. One of the boats might be my anxiety about tomorrow. Another, anger about a current situation or the state of things in life. There might be a boat called fear or failure unworthiness. And as each boat moves past your mind's eye, every judgment that comes to mind in one of these passing boats, take time to name it and then simply allow it to move on. And if you've noticed that you've jumped on board one of those boats, which is oftentimes what we can do, gently bring yourself to the awareness of sitting on the bank of the river. Sometimes we notice these boats and our first instinct is to torpedo them, to destroy them, rather than allow them to pass. But in this situation, we don't attack them. Simply remind yourself that I am not that and let it gently float by.
as you handle your own soul tenderly. You can carry the same loving wisdom that you create within to the outside world. That is the gift that you have come here to be. So take a moment in the quietness of this time and place and see what's arising within, what you can bless and simply let move on. And as you give compassion for these parts of us, for this passing self, know that the eternal you is that energy of never-ending divine love and blessing. Let it be what guides the ways in which you engage with yourself and ultimately the, engage, the ways you engage with the world. And as you are ready, begin to bring your attention back to this time and space, aware of your body, the chair supporting it, and when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So one of the simplest and most direct definitions of contemplation is taking a long, loving look at what is. Not at what even could be, although that's a good place to go sometimes, but what is right now. That the key to that is a loving look, not a critical look, not a look in which we say that's wrong, but rather that is just a part of my learning process as I move closer and closer to knowing who I am as a divine being. Our journey to God begins with the journey to being able to love ourselves. Beyond whatever thoughts and emotions we might be having, beyond whatever judgments might show up, and they will, beyond our need for certainty, even beyond our need for safety. Because stepping out into this realm can sometimes feel a little bit like we're stepping into the unknown, and that usually brings up some fear. I want to leave you with a final idea for you to contemplate this week. And again, it comes from a story that he shares. It's a story about a small Jewish boy who went to the rabbi and asked, how can I love God when I've never met him? How can I love God when I don't know that much about God from direct experience? And the rabbi looked at him and he said, start with a stone. Try and love a stone. Try to be present to the most simple and basic thing in reality so that you can see its goodness and beauty. Then let that goodness and beauty come into you. Let it speak to you. Let it engage you. Then the rabbi continued, and when you've mastered loving a stone, see if you can love a flower. A little easier. See if you can be present and open and let its life come into you. You don't have to pluck it. You don't have to possess it. You don't have to put it in a vase. Just right where it's at. Spend some time until you can just love that flower right where it is. 
And then he goes on to say, then try and love the sky. Try and love the mountains. Try and love every aspect of the beauty of creation. And when you've mastered all of that, then try and love a woman. <laughs> I know. Or a man, if, you're, if you were the girl in this story. He said, try and be faithful to this person, to sacrifice yourself for this energy of the love that you share with one another. And he said, and after you've learned how to love a stone and a flower and the sky and the mountains and all of nature and a woman, then you're ready to try and love God, to try and know God. When we can love this beautiful creation in all its forms, then we become part of the path. We become part of the journey. We get to that point where God becomes a verb rather than a noun, more of a process than a conclusion, more of an experience than a thought, more of a personal relationship than simply a concept or idea. For all of us, this journey is an endless, endless rhythmic dance. The steps may change every now and then, and yet there is always someone dancing with us. There is always someone who is leading us home. For it is our opportunity now to share of our tithes, our gifts, and our love offerings with this community. It is through your support, and only your support, that we do all that is ours to do in this community, and we are grateful. You know, it's been a tough year, and um, without the school, we've been running a little bit at a deficit, so as we wind up this year, if you find yourself moved to give a little extra, we will gratefully receive that. We are working hard on getting our school open in January, and I haven't even told the board this, but I'm feeling guided to share it. So we have hired um, a Montessori director and teacher this past week. I know. So now we just need all the children's to come and, uh, and be a part of it. So we're getting excited that we will have that as part of of our ongoing stream of good, not only from all the beautiful smiling faces that those of us who work in the office get to see each and every week, but through the flow of financial good that that also brings in to our community. So, you know, first Sunday we have historically, we haven't done it as consistent here lately, um, had first Sunday to be an opportunity to give a little extra to our reserve fund. So if you feel so moved, you just want to make sure you write that on there. But for all the ways in which we receive our good, we want to take that into our hands and into our hearts and into that realm of possibilities and bless it. Join me together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, Father, Mother God. The ushers will invite you to come.
we go into this day, into this week, finding ways to practice heaven right now, we go knowing our prayer for protection together. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Have a great week.